India is a land of dreams, where images, however fleeting, are remembered long after the journey's end. The railway is her lifeline, crossing not only distances, but bridging the boundaries of her many cultures. For over 900 million people, the railway has become a great unifier. Over one and a half million must work to keep it going. The Great Indian Railway touches the lives of everyone. For nothing is more a part of this country than the trains which are part of its soul. Over a century ago, the sound of the steam locomotive could be heard across the land as it rolled through the desert and the plains of India. In those days, villages and cities were isolated by vast distances, and the coming of the train would change them forever. Legends were told of the great fire eater that walked on lines of steel and breathed white clouds of smoke. Those who did not fear it came to see it for themselves. In remote outposts where there were no stations, banyan trees often marked the train stop and people anticipated its arrival like the coming of a great ship. There was always entertainment to greet the travelers, celebrating the trip for the magical event that it was. What had taken weeks by bullock cart could now be made in a matter of days. The hero was the driver. He was assigned one engine for life and cared for it as though it were a part of him, making sure it was fed coal and watered. It was like a living creature preparing for the long journey ahead. If there ever was a heart and soul of the railway, it began here with these locomotives. They were the symbol of the British Empire and held the romance of an age when men and machines united the country for the first time. But this era couldn't last forever. Now, the super-fast express trains command the rails and are moving India into a new century.
The railway is a living legacy of the British, who dominated the subcontinent for nearly 200 years. They laid down the first rails in 1850, and by Indian independence, dozens of railways reached across hundreds of princely states and territories. Today, all have been merged into one, stretching nearly 40,000 miles and connecting over 7,000 stations it is the largest railway under a single management in the world. Frontier Mail, the Tamil Nadu Express, the Punjab Mail, all long distance trains renowned in history. But one of the oldest is the Grand Trunk Express and it travels nearly the length of the country. Indians love to travel, whether it be on a religious pilgrimage or to visit relatives far away. They pack everything and bring everyone. They can go anywhere in the country for less than seven dollars. Space has a whole different meaning on an Indian train. People like to sit next to each other, talk and share stories. And a stranger isn't a stranger for long. More than 11,000 trains travel through India every day, but it's in the three-tier second-class coaches that the real spirit of the country can be found. If anyone wants to know what India is all about, you could just travel in one of these trains and you could talk to people, you see. You'll actually meet people from uh, different parts of the country and you can actually uh, have a, uh, a look into the various cultures, you see. Now that's a cultural diversity in India. You can ac actually enjoy this cultural diversity, traveling in such long trains, say, from, which goes from one end of the nation to the other. other end. So such long trains you can enjoy. If you're really interested, you definitely you will experience it. Every Indian train has ticketless passengers who are part of its character. Gypsies, beggars and sweeper boys who make their living earning tips between stations. I meet every type of people here. Maybe they are millionaires, they are uh, the poorest. They are engineers, doctors, bankers, every type of persons I am meeting. And when I travel, I, talk, I have an opportunity to talk to them, make friendship with them. We sometimes come closer to them and we become family friends for life. We are going to Betul because I'm getting married there and all my relatives and friends and parents will be coming there just because of my marriage. In Jenny, I am in a business trip. This is my business trip. So I am moving always in the trains from different part of the country. We have the opportunity to see the uh, the natural beauty uh, of the whole country because the, uh, the the natural beauty also changes from each and every uh, 200 uh, kilometers you will find the change in uh, the trees and the landscape which you will not uh, get it when you fly by plane so that is one of the reasons also we have taken the decision to go by It's wonderful. It's a wonderful way to, to see India and um, feel that you're a part of India and, and not so much separate separate from it. Um, you know, you're here and you're you're eating here and sleeping here with with everybody else, and uh, it's it's great. It's it's a wonderful wonderful way to to see the country. How do you feel about traveling on the railway? How 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 do you feel? Very very nice. Very nice. Uh. <coughs>
For centuries, explorers have been drawn to the east. In the 1660s, the British took possession of the strand of islands that curved into the Arabian Sea. They would make them the great port city of Bombay. Their gateway of India still stands as a memory of their empire's former glory. Bombay is now one of India's fastest growing cities. And the British presence seems unchanged at Victoria Terminus. Opened in 1888, it was built on the site of the first railway station. But now, it's the headquarters of Central, the busiest of nine zones in the Indian Railway. From this historic place, one of the most important men in the railway oversees his domain. This is the seat of power of the general manager. Problem between Kirasgarh and Kesla. There was a disaster. Every morning, Virendra Vishnu calls upon his officers to account for every detail in a monumental system. From major accidents to minor delays, nothing escapes his attention. As many as eight trains, they have all been fired. It was from this same office that the British ran their railway. And with independence in 1947, they turned it over to Indian leadership. All right. Hello, Jabalpur. But now the GM controls a far more complex network. With 200,000 men beneath him, he runs 2,000 trains a day. Ah, Madan. Namaskar. What is happening today? What are your prospects of loading? Sir, uh, yesterday we did 8.5. Ajay, you just speak to CME. Your diesel utilization has slumped. Your diesel utilization has slumped. Your, uh, your sick wagon balances and all the yards are heavy. The stable loads are heavy. Just speak to CME. Hello. Hello, Madan. Ah, yes, sir. Lal Rao. Katni Shed. For the last 15 days, it has been having very high failure rate. Uh -huh. uh, some tightening up is required in Katni. Some tightening up is required in Katni. What is required? Tightening up. Tightening up is required in Katni. Uh -huh. Vishnu is more than a figurehead. If something goes wrong, he shoulders the full responsibility. And every month, he makes it a point to leave his office and visit his men in the field. Give your guidance. Okay. And I will, it should be deemed to be approved by GM. Because I am going on an inspection on the guard section. There should be a bigger, we must fix responsibility. And the, and the truckers, yeah, the trucker strike, Mr. Mathur, has to be taken care of because unless you do... Few traditions have changed since the days when the British walked these halls. And like them, Vishnu sets out on a surprise inspection to make spot checks along the line. But where the GM is concerned, nothing is a secret for long. And word of his coming has already been passed down the line. Like a present-day Maharaja, Vishnu holds court in his private inspection coach. With full kitchen staff in attendance and all the ceremonies inherited from his predecessors. The Indian railways constitute the lifeline of India. And they gave, it was given to us by the British. They gave us two things. The Indian railways and a very powerful administrative system run by the bureaucrats. We were now going on an inspection trip and during this inspection trip we, we proposed to go over the entire railway lines, see what uh, management techniques are there, see how the cabins, the points and uh, the people who, who manage these points look after themselves and look after the equipment. Each one has his area of responsibility and uh, a super check has to be exercised. 
So when we go out in line, our objective is to find out what deficiencies are there and take measures to overcome them. No single person can possibly check on everything. The system depends on workers whose dedication goes largely unseen. Under the eyes of the cabin men, tens of thousands of coaches transport more than 12 million people a day. And one mistake can cost thousands of lives. For this is a human railway where the strength of a lever man means the safe passage of a train. It is the largest employer in the world. Officially 1.6 million work for the railway. But Vishnu estimates that nearly 80 million people depend on it for their livelihood. <laughs> The railway touches even the most remote corners of the country. There are over 38,000 level crossings and as many as 100,000 gatekeepers who man the roads. Inspections are endless and over 100,000 bridges need to be seen to. For station masters, the inspection trolley may be the most comfortable way of getting around. But one of the lowest workers on the ladder is perhaps the most important one. Every day, the key man walks the same stretch, four miles down and four miles back checking every inch of track, making sure that all the bolts are in place. He's one of thousands of unsung heroes. If the key man is there, then all is safe. But despite the constant vigilance, hundreds of accidents take place every year. Tunnels are especially dangerous and must be continually checked for loose rock, which could fall on the passing trains. Using long wooden poles, some tunnels are still sounded by hand. A cave-in could cause a major catastrophe. When we go out to the field, and interact with the lowest functionary in the railways. He may be a railwayman, he may be a pointsman, a gateman, and the general manager goes to him, meets him, shakes his hands and gives him a reward or reprimands him. The news goes round everywhere. He will be very happy to be reprimanded by a general manager. And there are some people, they come and touch my feet. In India, that's a custom. So that, that sort of a thing happens, it happens everywhere. So, uh, it, it's a very satisfying experience to be around, to be heading an organization like the Central Railway. Given an opportunity, I'll do it all over again. Thank you. Calcutta. Some have called her a city of darkness. Others know her as the city of joy. But nowhere in India is a place more alive and life more bizarre. Her legendary streets have nothing to hide. Six million refugees fleeing famines and wars have descended upon her. And Calcutta turns no one away. Even the gods live in her streets and are symbols of the city's spirit.
Howrah Bridge is the busiest bridge in the world, where hundreds of thousands fight to make their way across every day. For this is the link to Howrah Station, where travelers have their first taste of the city's urban madness. It's the largest station in India and somehow manages to cope with nearly a million people every day. Built in 1906 on the site of an orphanage, Haura offers shelter to everyone and has become a city unto itself. It's up to one man to supervise it all. Good morning. The station manager, Mr. Mitra, oversees a staff of 2,500 people providing services for every imaginable situation. It has worked so well for so long that many of the old ways are still in place. With his entourage of deputies, the station manager makes the inspection rounds. But tolerance underlies everything here, and he'll overlook those who have come from the villages, bringing only what they can carry, and dreams of a better life. Haura is their refuge before venturing out into the city. Some will stay for days, Others will camp out for weeks. For them, it is more than just a destination. How has become their home? But there is order amid what appears to be confusion. The station manager upholds a strict code of cleanliness. And if a vendor is found to be lacking, he will write him up. Over 500 trains arrive and depart every day. But the 1250 arrival of the Rajdani Express is perhaps the most eagerly awaited. The train is very late. The train is very late. She is the flagship of the modern railway, one of the fastest, most expensive trains in the country, and her late arrival spurs a rush to the platform. Her clientele is India's upper class. And the baggage coolies who know this will risk their lives to meet the train. This one tip can make their day. There are 1,600 coolies at Haura, and their job is coveted. They pay the railway 30 cents a month for their uniform and the right to solicit travelers. And only the most aggressive can survive. For those who do leave Haura, it is a land of fond farewells. But the station and Calcutta 
are not easily left behind, and their images will long be remembered. The Grand Trunk Express continues southbound. The trip from New Delhi to Madras will last 38 hours. But for many, the journey is an adventure, and it doesn't matter how long it takes. Long distance trains have become temporary homes for village India, and those on board are captive audiences for ticketless travelers who earn their keep, providing everything from entertainment to food. On a train, meals are a big event, and passengers are constantly being solicited with different kinds of fare. Twelve bearers run the length of 22 coaches, waiting on as many as 2,000 people. They serve up to 400 hot railway meals twice a day. In the pantry car, cooks prepare food to suit the religious mandates of an Indian train, non-veg or vegetarian, for Muslims, Hindus, Christians. The hardest job may be in trying to satisfy the tastes of so many, and tastes do change from north to south. The food is, uh, uh, for, uh, for a man, it is very sufficient. It is, uh, we can comfortably, it's, uh, yes, it's more than sufficient for uh, one person, it is given to us. Because uh, here you have the rice and then uh, dal, we call it the grams, and then vegetables also is available. Then it is, a, it is a full meal for us. Meals is not so good. Meals is not so good. So we will depend on some fruits and veggies, this uh, biscuits, etc. We do, we do, I don't take uh, food in the train. They are not uh, making it properly. It's uh, not properly cooked. Moreover, uh, quantity also they are giving it not uh, up to the standard. The food is available to you and supplied by the railways. Why should I go out? And why should I carry? And why should I uh, penalize my wife to get cooked at home and bring it and all this? Why should I do that? I'm not. I'll be the last person to do that. There is one train in India which travels not only distance, but also back through time. She is the Palace on Wheels, and for the next six days, she will journey through the legendary desert kingdoms of Rajasthan. Her 75 passengers will be treated like the Maharajas who once traveled through their states on their own princely railways. She rivals the Orient Express, and her 14 carriages are patterned after the royal saloons built at the turn of the century. But these provide all the modern comforts of a luxury hotel. There is nothing more magical than riding on the footplate of a steam locomotive. Her three-man crew is the best in the country, and they prepare for an unforgettable race through the night. The 
this is the first long distance train journey we've ever made. Uh, so of course, as far as we're concerned, it's, it's something a bit special and it's something we've saved up for a long time to do. It, it's one of our holidays of a lifetime, shall we say. Uh, and it's, it's, it's a wonderful experience. I never dreamt that it could be quite so luxurious, shall we say. And also contrasting well, yes. between the poor and the rich, really. This is what you notice mostly about India. If you stay at a five-star hotel and you get all the service and everything else, and then you look out of your window and there's a shanty town down below with all the poor people. It's the contrast that I notice more than anything when since we've been here. Is it you? Yeah, but the oh yeah, well, India itself, yes. But the uh, the actual, you know, train itself and the service that we get on here is sort of second to none. I mean, the minute you open the door, there's somebody there saying, well, can I help you, sir? Which is something a bit special as far as we're concerned. They will wake in Rajasthan, where traces of the oldest civilizations in India can be found, and nomadic tribes still follow ancient trade routes into Central Asia. It seems as if the palace on wheels has returned to the days of the Rajput warriors who fought for and ruled over this land for a thousand years. This train will transport its passengers into a world of palaces and fortresses which inspire fairy tales. The fort at Jodhpur was built in 1459 and endured waves of invasions. From the battlements above, the sounds of the streets ride up on the wind, just as they did in medieval times. One dynasty of kings left perhaps the most dazzling legacy of them all. Over 250 years ago, the Maharana of Udaipur built his palace on a lake in the middle of the desert. Like many of India's exotic residences, the lake palace has now become a hotel for the wealthy. The Palace on Wheels engine consumes eight tons of coal between stops. And there's little relief for the crew on the footplate where temperatures soar well over 100 degrees. Inside, meals are an elaborate affair. Working out of two kitchens, gourmet chefs prepare five-course meals of Chinese, Indian, and continental cuisine. Well, there's an enormous sense of history when you travel in this train. Uh, they have sought to recreate, recapture uh, what uh, the trains must have been like 20, 30 years ago. 
uh, at, at, at various levels, from the quality of service that you get, from the kind of food, the cuisine, uh, the entire, the ambience. Uh, you, it's, 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 it's a journey down memory lane. For me, it was really nostalgia for the past, for the splendors of the East, as it were, and the rhythms of the train are just marvelous. It's like an image in the train and image out. So it's like cutting to a very beautiful rhythm. At the edge of the great tar desert, Jaisalmer, the golden city, lies at the westernmost point of the line. Built in the 12th century by a bandit chieftain, the fort rises up from the desert floor. For over 300 years, it was a haven for prosperous merchants, and their descendants still live within these walls. Cut off from the rest of India, it seems to be a city in waiting for something or someone to return. Perhaps it still longs for the days of the spice caravans that plied through here to the Great Silk Road. Oh, I love India. I love it. I love the uh, palaces that we've seen and the oh. people. The people are charming. They really are. I mean, the beggars are a pest because you, you get them all over the place. But as for the actual people, they're smiling, happy, and always pleased to see you. And they work very hard when you see them working, and they <laughs> stay <laughs> leisure a lot, <laughs> they don't. So it's been splendor, it's been ecstasy, <laughs> it's been the past, it's ourselves, <coughs> it's the heat, it's the dust. It's, it's, it's a milieu of uh, kaleidoscopic colors. It's been beautiful. It's Thank a wonderful you. microcosm uh, of, of, uh, of, a, of an ancient tradition surviving and coexisting in a very contemporary India. India's most romantic story is told by the Taj Mahal, built by the Emperor Shah Jahan in 1653 as a tomb for his beloved queen. It has become the symbol of immortal love. heard a lot about the Taj, who hasn't, but it still hits you. You come prepared for it, but it's still magnificent. It's, it's much larger than I thought it would be. It's awesome. It, it's magnificent. There's, there's, you know, it's, it's very nice architecture. It's very Islamic architecture and in, in, in a Hindu country, which is, again, this tells us that if buildings can uh, be together in one country, religions can also survive in one country together. That's the way I look at it. In fact, this is one of the few things that is more beautiful in reality than in pictures or photographs. There are very few things of this type in the world, which you like more when you see it really. With all the gloss and the glamour you get in the pictures. We are very proud of it. It's one thing which gets people all over the world from and people, anybody who talks of India, he talks of the Taj and we feel very happy about it. There were once 28 princely railways in India. Those days are gone and their trains have become a part of history. But south of the Taj Mahal, Gwalior is the home of one railway which began as a prince's toy. 
The Sindhya family of Maharajas settled here in the mid-1700s. A European influence was strong, and as a young boy, his highness, the Maharaja of Gwalior, asked his English tutor for a train. It came by ship, with two and a half miles of track. He extended it to serve his state in 1899, and today it is still known as the Gwalior Light Railway. The village chieftains still ride in from the countryside, singing praises to the Sindhya name. Traveling as his great-grandfather did on the two-foot-wide, narrow-gauge rails, Aditya Sindhya looks out over his family's former kingdom. Well, this used to be prime hunting area not too long ago, about 40, 50, 40 years ago. And uh, in those days, one would just uh, take the light railway, which is the one we're on right now, and uh, we used to have Rolls-Royce hunting carriages, and one would just shoot off the train. And uh, you had an immense amount of wildlife here. Not only that, but when uh, parties used to come from other states or even abroad, uh, they used to be uh, hunting trains know, and hunting caravans that were organized on this light rail. And we have many an occasion when even actually the Shah of Iran shot his first tiger in Gwalior off the light railway. Although much of their property and their titles were taken away after independence, the Sindhias have shifted their power into the realm of politics. Aditya's father, Madhavrao Sindhya, has been the Minister for Railways, Civil Aviation, and Tourism. And his son hopes to follow in his footsteps. My family has been around for about 300 years now, and we've been in Gwali for 250 years. But unlike a lot of other families, we don't claim to be uh, descendants from the moon or the sun. We are, and proud to say so, that we are the sons of the soil. We originally started as farmers and peasants. And in that, that connection is still strong. Even though we live in the Mangas, opulence and grandeur in this palace, and it's the place where I'm deeply connected to because I grew up here, I'm still connected to the earth. That lifeline is still vibrant. My great-grandfather and my grandfather after him always impressed upon us the re that the realities are something that we should always face. My father, accepting and realizing it, uh, sees his role as the Maharaja of his state in politics today, looking after his people. The grandeur is all gone, but the connection is still there. The people know, weeks before he arrives, that Sindhya is coming. He is now a member of the ruling Congress party, but his strength comes from an age-old devotion to the Maharaja. In his home state, he is revered as a king. Like his forefathers, he comes to the people to listen to their troubles, choosing one who will speak for all. It is a time-honored exchange. They know that he will listen and that their requests won't go unanswered. For the Maharaja is now a powerful politician, 
And as he rallies for the votes his party needs, he promises to look after his people. He is one of the few who could become the country's future prime minister. For all his importance, Madhav Rao Sindhya has not lost his boyhood love for toy trains. In the palace dining room, the first electric train in Gwalior still runs on silver rails. Its crystal decanters are pulled by a solid silver engine brought over from London nearly a hundred years ago. This is a train which seems to have caught the imagination of uh, people from all parts of the world. It was uh, made uh, at the time when the Gwalior Light Railway was uh, first begun and presented as a memento to my grandfather. And uh, it's an exact copy of uh, the, the railway engine that pulled that uh, light railway train along. Uh, I remember uh, the last time uh, it was used was uh, for a banquet in honor of the late king of Nepal, King Mahindra. And the banquet uh, went very well, seats 75 this table and all the guests were uh, we're finishing with dessert when the train started and of course everyone as usual is very intrigued and it passed Her Majesty and uh, served her toffees and chocolates or whatever some had brandy some had cigars and after that the train went on and unfortunately before it reached um, His Majesty's chair uh, a rather over enthusiastic uh, enthusiastic guest uh, tried to take uh, two of the decanters out at the same time. He wanted the brandy and the cigars. And for some reason or, reason or other, he felt he had to snatch at both. And uh, then everything went wrong. The train just wouldn't start again. And His Majesty hadn't yet been served his brandy or his cigars or whatever. Uh, I was furiously pressing the button under the, under the host chair and still nothing was happening. We had electricians uh, scurrying around uh, under the table to set it right, but no, it just wouldn't budge. It's a very temperamental train. It doesn't like to be uh, ill-treated, and uh, I don't think it was prepared to suffer the indignity of uh, having two of its decanters uh, pinched at the same time. But uh, that was the last time it was used, and as I said, it's always been an item of great curiosity. In India, there is no place more dangerous than a crowded railway platform at night. And when the Shatabdi Express arrives, it brings chaos to Gwalior Station. The Sindhias are beginning their journey back to the seat of government in New Delhi. People have waited for hours and will risk their lives in the mob that has gathered, just to glimpse the royal family and to bid them farewell. If there is a spirit of the railway, it is found in the thousands of small stations which have become part of the fabric of Indian life. They are centers where everyone gathers, and those who can't afford to travel will come just to watch the trains. The most impressive arrivals have always been the broad gauge steam locomotives, lovingly called the Black Beauties. 
They ride on the widest rails, and their wheels stand taller than a man. But their presence is now becoming rare, and those who grew up with them will miss them the most. Black is beautiful. Our steam locos are our black beauties. We feel with the phasing out of steam locos as if we are doing away with one of our kith and kin with whom we had blood relations. All throughout Eastern Railway, local sheds are busy preparing their engines for a black beauty contest. It is a competition like no other. Only the best engines are entered, and to win the Black Beauty is the highest honor a shed could have. Dunbad, Rampurhat, Sahib Ganj, Asenso, Jaja. Five sheds hurry to add the finishing touches, transforming these workhorses into the beauties that they really are. This possibly should be the very last black beauty contest of Indian Railways. We meant to bring to you the effect of the steam locos when they were in their heydays to show how they looked, how they worked, and for just one more time, perhaps live and outlive the glory of those days when the steam locos bore the brunt of Indian railways. beauty contest remains very much valid today because perhaps this is the last time that we are going to be able to have uh, such a contest anywhere on the Indian railways. Perhaps in the rest of the world like China and others steam will continue but on Indian railways the pressures of economics have forced us to give up the lovable old monster of steam with this lo lovable uh, sound and uh, unique visual pleasure which children loved and uh, therefore aspired to become locomotive uh, drivers when they grew up. But the people who are maintaining them, who are operating them, who have to work very, very hard to make it run for a kilometre, for them to keep their enthusiasm at the highest level, to make them feel that they are part of a very, very major organisation like the Indian Railways, they have to be given a boost, which I think this kind of contest does give. It helps people to remember that the steam has served a glorious era from the old days if you look back into the past. There is intense competition amongst all those who have slaved on these uh, locomotives, these ten competing locomotives, and therefore each one wants to win the prize. Therefore the judges are un uh, under intense scrutiny, perhaps more than the judges are in real life. And they have to therefore make it as scientific as possible. They have therefore div divided the system of grading into three distinct groups. One is decoration, for which they give 25% marks, the functionality, which is uh, we are giving as much as 50% uh, marks. 
and also the um, ceramic blanketing is being given a 25% marks. And uh, I think that the judges uh, will be totally fair and clear in their uh, judgment and with the, may the best local win. What is important when you see a when the whole thing should be uniformly red. The moment you see a black spot, there's a time where there's a hole and then the fire bars can burn. So when we are seeing the fire, you have to see that it looks uniformly red. That's it. There should be no black localized black spots. Plus that thickness, the fire bed should be uniform. Those are things we have to look for. How is maintaining the fire? Very important. Everybody wants to win and none more than Mr. Aurora, a shed foreman who has worked in steam since he was 17. On board Romperhat's engine, he is never at a loss for words. Explaining that even with all the hard work, they had just run out of time. Like all the engines, the judges take into account how efficiently she runs. They put her through the paces, while Aurora hangs on like a doting father. So bosses, my examiners, they have been very much pleased with the bus, with you boys, with my staff, with my driver and other fellows, you know, all the whole Rampurat has done in decorating this locomotive, in making it fit mechanically sound. And they have checked all the points and I think we have got, if not 10%, then at least 90%. Now we should leave the result to Almighty God, you know, so Almighty God is there. They parade in all their glory, and anticipation runs high. Now it's up to the judges to reveal the last Black Beauty winner. Nandini of Asansol Shed will claim the prize. But perhaps the greater honor is to be personally congratulated by the general manager of Eastern Railway. Okay. <coughs> Second. Uh, this was the most functionally beautiful locomotive as well as aesthetically beautiful locomotive. We had gone in for the safety fittings, aesthetics and functionality. But this loco was absolutely the best, there's no doubt about it. For Nandini and her crew, this is an occasion to remember. But they know, as they back her into the shed, that their victory is bittersweet. For despite the fact that the black beauties have proven themselves today, another fate awaits them. In northeast India, a little toy train climbs the foothills of the Himalaya, the tallest mountains in the world. Every morning, Buddhist monks look towards the east, welcoming the sun to the remote mountain town of Darjeeling.
Darjeeling has always been a frontier town, where an oriental look enters the faces of India. But it also tells of another heritage. The British loved the climate so much, they made it a hill station to escape the heat of the plains below. And the sounds of the train they brought echo up from the valleys. For the people of the mountain, the train has always been a part of their lives. In the days of the British Raj, it carried the famous Darjeeling tea down from the plantations. This is still a place where the day is measured not only by the sun, but by the routine passing of the trains. Eighteen little locomotives run back and forth on the Darjeeling Himalayan line. The youngest is 70 years old, and the oldest is 105. Every day, several trains climb from the plain of the Ganges in about the same amount of time it took Mark Twain when he came to Darjeeling in 1896. The beginning of every trip is a ritual for the six-man crew. Each engine is an antique heirloom that's been entrusted to their care and they look after them like living, breathing creatures, feeding and watering them. The fireman knows that only a good head of steam can carry the train up to 7,407 feet to reach the highest station in all of Asia. With two men riding on front, ready to throw sand on the rails for traction, and a coal breaker riding on top, the train finally sets out. Each engine has its own distinct personality, and no one understands his better than the driver, Mr. Guru. Like his father, he was assigned this same loco for life. And everyone along the way knows it's him by the sound of his whistle. For Shurab Tendif, one of many who have fought for its preservation, it's a reminder that some things do stay the same, and not to have it would be a great loss. Well, the, que the question is, uh, what does the train mean to people like myself who grew up in these hills? Uh, well, you have to remember that uh, when I was young, people really didn't travel that very much. Uh, the airplane hadn't arrived, and uh, the train was an important image for all of us, uh, an escape to the outer world, uh, a chance to see something over the mountains. Uh, you had this train which represents to us an opportunity for adventure. We used to jump on and off the train. Tickets weren't that important. There's a chugging, the sound of the movement of the train, uh, the energy of this train, it was like little Tibetan terrier. This is a train that belongs to the people, enticing the adventurous to test themselves. They risk a scolding by the driver, but it's worth it. For children, it's a plaything. And for adults, 
is a chance to become a kid again. But the journey is not to be taken lightly. Mr. Guru will have to coax the engine up some of the steepest slopes in the world. He knows each turn and the grade of every incline. And he'll have to keep a vigilant eye out for anything that could go wrong. Perhaps the biggest worry is that the axles may overheat, which could derail the train. These trains were built at a time when people expected things to last. But they could never have imagined that the engines would still be running today. And Tindaria Workshop has kept them going since 1914. The parts have long since stopped coming over from Great Britain. Now everything must be made by hand. Obstacles that the British overcame in 1881 are still impressive even now. On the foothills of the Himalaya, they had little room to maneuver, and only by ingenious loops and switchbacks and the narrowest of tracks could the little toy train reach the top. the train does not run we do feel that there is something absent and we do feel it very strongly but as long as it is there yes it's a part of life and uh, every day if we don't see it we see that something definitely is missing like the train and the tracks and everything nothing has changed everything is the same only we are changing and now the name has changed previously it was the queen of the hills it's the grandmother of the hills. The tracks cross the road 120 times, and the train usually has the right of way. But on the busy road to Darjeeling, accidents do happen, and there is always a point of debate about who was at fault. Hey. 
In a tight fit, the train usually wins out, but the argument will go on long after it is gone. I think you ought to know that the train uh, played a, a very important part in the imaginings of school children out here because as the months rolled on, the school years extended from uh, March to November generally, and uh, the thinking of all the children before the day of the airplane was uh, preparation for this wonderful adventure, going on the toy train. And it would be often heard various uh, songs, one of them which I might just uh, recite to you. Uh, it's one version, there are many versions of course. The more adult the child, the more uh, interesting the version. Uh, this one goes like this. When I, it refers to the DHR, which is the Darjeeling Himalayan Railway. Uh, it goes like this. The DHR is far too slow. Do da, do da. The DHR is far too slow, oh, do da da. The DHR is far too slow, do da, do da. The DHR is far too slow, oh, do da da. Going away to London, going away to town. Well, the DHR is far too slow, do da, do da day. Bombay. It is the financial capital of India, and with a population of 13 million, it has one of the busiest commuter rail systems in the world. Every day, five million people pour in and out of the city, gambling with their lives just to get to work on time. Each train is designed to carry 1,700 standing passengers, but swells to almost 7,000, building in numbers which the officials call the dense, super dense, and hyper dense crush loads. With over 70,000 people per square mile, Bombay is six times denser than New York City, and a train arrives and departs every two minutes. But many live up to two and three hours away, where the real commuter drama unfolds. At over 100 stations along the way, they vie for one of 2,000 trains heading downtown. At Borivoli Station, 15 men have been meeting up for 10 years. They call themselves the 854 Group and every morning they stake out strategic spots along the platform. With speed and luck, they can claim a few seats that they'll share between them. They have only 30 seconds before the train pulls out again and consider their daily ritual like a workout at the gym. It's a 
very big advantage traveling by this train. We make so many friends, we discuss many topics, and we come to know many things about what is happening all over the Bombay, not only all over Bombay, all over India, what is happening. We just uh, discussed uh, everything but not politics. Not politics? No. Why not politics? We hate. <laughs> you... We discuss everything under the sun but not politics, no religion, and no Harshad Mehta. <laughs> Yes, I am a part of the same group who just spoke to you. We are members of about 13 or 14 of us. And uh, we have been very close to each other, travelling this train. We have uh, ties with our families. We meet quite often at parties. And, uh, well, we are very close to each other. What I feel is uh, that uh, the Bombay, Bombay uh, suburban the passenger is facing the most arduous task while reaching his office. You see, the capacity of this rake is about maximum 1,400 people. But during peak hours, there are more than 7,000 people traveling, but still nobody grumbles about it. I think that's the beauty of Bombay people. Then this is a part of the life because we, we have to find some, 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 something good from the bad things. Women prefer to travel separately from men if not for comfort, then for safety. On every train, they have their own coaches and even have their own ladies' special trains. It's better if you travel with a lady special than in a gents' compartment, right? probably where there are ladies and gents together because at times when the trains are too very much crowded, these men, they, as few of them, not all I would blame, do misbehave, you know, which is not safe for we young girls in today's times. And I think the railway should introduce more trains, more women specials to at least make a lady's journey comfortable. Otherwise, I don't think there are any special privileges given to women in this state. No way, not in our workplace, no way. We are treated like men. It's just, you know, your life is always at risk, you know, jumping in the train. And there are accidents. About two, three months back, somebody fell down in between the two compartments. And uh, what I heard that, I think he lost his life. Every day, the daily average on the suburban section uh, of the people who are killed is about eight to nine passengers. That is about 2,000 passengers in a year on both the suburban railways are killed every year on this track. It is one of the greatest problems, uh, problem for the railways and also for the motorman. If motorman does not get heart attack, at least as soon as suddenly someone comes, he get blood pressure. It's a no man's land where the footpaths cross the tracks and the trains roll through the playgrounds of the largest slum in Asia. For the 854 group, despite all the hassles and dangers they've been through, the trip was worth it. For this is Bombay, a city teeming with energy. And to them, an exciting train ride is the best way to start the day. The train stops only long enough for the motorman to walk from one end to the other. But within six hours, for millions of commuters headed home. The journey will begin all over again. India is a country of villages. 
More than 70% of its people live out their lives in a day-to-day -day existence where there is no hurry. And only the changing seasons mark the passage of time. This is where the railway is a lifeline, bringing these remote areas in touch with the rest of the world. In South India, Palur is one of thousands of small way stations which haven't changed much since British colonial times. It is a single line track off the main route to Madras and only four trains a day stop here. Mr. Govinda Rajan is the station master. He took a demotion from a bigger station, choosing Palur to be near his sick wife and to live out his days in the peaceful quiet of the country. He shares his responsibilities with Kamakshi, a railway widow, who is officially the sweeper porter. Between the two of them, they run the entire station. Palur means milk village, and for the last hundred years, the villagers have relied on the milk train to carry their cans to the city markets. But before the train arrives, Govinda Rajan must coordinate with other stations to make sure that his line is clear for the coming train. It is a time-honored system in place since the days of the British. A ball token must be carried by the driver, giving him the right of way on a single line track. At every station, he must pass the token and pick up another. Only then will he have permission to continue on his way. I am asking line clear. This is the authority. Hello? Token C-17. The line is officially open and Kamakshi can change the signals that will indicate to the driver that the track ahead is safe. She will pass the ball on to the driver and prepares the cane pouch. She is one of the few women working directly with the trains, but gained her job after a great loss. Her husband had been a fireman on a steam engine and committed suicide when he didn't make driver. It is the railway's custom to give a position to the widow and Kamakshi will have a job for life. As the train comes in, the ball token is handed over. Now the driver can move safely into the next section. Hello. 
Mr. Govindarajan has dedicated 33 years of his life to the railway and understands better than anyone how much these trains mean to rural India. But changes are coming and he has received word that with his retirement his post will not be filled and Palur station will be closed. They tell him that with only a few trains a day there just isn't enough profit. Soon, the trains won't be stopping here, and people will have to take the roads. He will be the last station master of Palur. On the main trunk lines between big cities, the fast trains run non-stop. The Grand Trunk Express nears its destination. The journey to Madras is coming to an end. And the passengers who have spent two nights together ride in a world of their own. Before the train even stops, those who are wise to the system will start negotiating for coolies. For this is Madras, the largest city in the south, and the hassle of any big station is only just beginning. Arrivals usually mean hello, but in India, they often mean goodbye. And those who were strangers only a few days ago are now departing as good friends. Uh, the coolie is just coming because he has gone there to bring the trolley for me to pick up the uh, luggage. As a matter of fact, in Western countries, you don't depend on the coolies at all because uh, you, you, uh, you yourself carry all your baggages. But here we have a number of people, the population is increased every day. So we have to engage them also but in one way or the other, so just to give the money so that he can live comfortably. The journey is over, the baggage problem solved, and now one of the hardest parts of the trip is coming up. The search for an honest taxi driver. The problem is that uh, we don't get uh, the, the, because according to the meter, they won't, they won't take the... Huh? <laughs> And uh, now you know when, when that chap was increasing, with the, he was demanding more than the tariff rate. Another young boy has come forward. He says, "I would run the taxi according to the meter, whatever the meter says. I will pay for it." I, I, no, he says that you give me, I will accept it. 
the young boy he come forward now it means the younger generation which is there they are coming forward to help the passengers who are coming in the uh, by train they are here i really appreciate really So what finally yes. happened? Uh, this one, he has agreed and uh, he has been taking me to my home. So I'm happy. Because they uh, are very good people. Just like our See, some of the people, family. some elements are always there, whether you are here in uh, India or in America, wherever you go, the human tendency is such. When uh, Adam and Eve was there, the Saturn was also there. So there is, uh, you can't help. Uh, That's all. No, that is the factory no, mind. That's all. Okay. Bye. On Southern Railway, south of Madras, the Pondicherry Special makes her last journey. Nothing evokes the romance of the railway like a steam engine. Her arrival into Pondicherry station is a grand event, and she will bring the platform to life for one last time. This is one of the few holdouts of steam. The locomotives were phased out of the big cities years ago. and now even small stations are seeing them vanish but perhaps the greatest loss will be felt by those who have steam in their soul and don dapani is one who feel it the most a third generation railway man he became what his father a gatekeeper always hoped he would be a driver the pride of the line now he's been given the honor of taking the pondicherry special on her final run Those who live along the track have grown accustomed to trains. But it's always a special occasion when a steam train goes by. His engine may be old and worn down by age, but Don Dapani knows that what he is doing is something noble and historic. The gate men would be among the last to witness the great steam engines on a full run. 
And as they close the gates behind them, they know that this is not just the passing of trains, but the passing of an era. Like a keeper of the rails, cabin master Maji has been directing trains for the past 31 years. He feels that the end of steam will leave his cabin like an empty house after the children have gone away. Hello? Are you going to go? Yes, okay. In India, the relationship between railway men has always been like family. The firemen, guards, cabin masters, and gatekeepers all have developed a deep bond through the years. Station masters on the single line tracks and the drivers of steam know that a time is coming to an end. Now the trading of the cane pouch marks the changing of the guard. Both Govindarajan and Don Dupani have since been retired. The Pondicherry special has been condemned. And Little Palur Station is now closed forever. Varanasi. Madurai, Bardaman. These are some of the sheds where generations of workers were born to serve the locomotive, with a craft held sacred. And where it was always believed that a father's knowledge would one day be handed down to his son. We'll be closing down this steam loco shed in a couple of months when the last of these black booties will have moved out 
this shed had uh, something like uh, 71 locomotives a few years back. What we feel sad about the whole thing is that uh, something which fascinated uh, every railway uh, traveller over many, many years is dying out. The steam locomotive looks fascinating, it sounds fascinating. It breathes out a lot of fascinating things also. What fascinated uh, everybody was uh, that the locomotive was ever so visible. It had nothing to hide. It wasn't dressed up. And what I feel personally sad about is that with the locomotive is dying out a breed of men who had nerves of steel, they were men of muscle, understood metal, what it was all about. What we get today in lieu is the diesels, the electrics, which have really no muscle in them. They are all technology, there is no sprit behind them. To us as old railwaymen, they are really uh, not comparables. This shed where the epitaph is now being written will see a gloomy picture in a few months from now and uh, will lose ever so slightly a part of our past, something on which the railways all over the world have survived for the last hundred plus years. With that, uh, a lot of our soul will be gone. Every day, more and more black beauties are being pulled from the working lines. The iron beasts are now easy prey to scavengers who will take even their last bits of precious coal. The once busy sheds are becoming graveyards. For loco foreman Mr. Aurora, returning is like visiting old friends. See, this is the tragic part on my life. I was born and brought up in this, with this steam locomotive. Now I feel as if I am left all alone and I am standing like a helpless man, can't do. But this is the demand from my nation. I feel as if a most loving member of my family is being cut into cut into pieces in my presence an old man looking who is looking after the children and he is standing he cannot do anything for his children at this dying at their this dying stage feel so bad really i feel like weeping i become helpless creature but as i have told you a day one has to die similarly they have also to vanish one day or the other The music, the everything, I know, I wish if this should be uh, known to everybody. The simple, the first of all, I let you know how the whistle sounds of a steam locomotive. Sounding of a whistle from a steam locomotive. <laughs> this is from WP class of locomotive. Now, when the driver opens the regulator, that time steam goes from the throttle valve, it comes to the valves, and from valves it goes to the cylinder. The sound, the music, the rhythmical music, the most beautiful music, the most uh, unavailable music from any other source, I am just going to uh, give that music to you. If 
you like so, sir. Just the driver opens the regulator. All across India, steam sheds have turned into auction houses. The locomotives await the highest bidder. They are the businessmen who have waited for the sheds to close before making their move. They buy the engines which are, to them, worth only their weight in scrap metal. Most of these men of steam will choose to stay with the railway. Some will have to be retrained, and others may have to relocate far from their homes. But for all, a way of life is over. There will be one survivor of steam, and by government ruling, it will remain. It is the Darjeeling Himalayan toy train, the oldest mountain railway in India. She is the symbol of the railway, 
and evokes the emotional and spiritual ties which the country has for its trains. The men who run her stand for the many who have devoted themselves to keeping the lifeline going. And for all those whose lives it touches, this will always be the Great Indian Railway. We hope you have enjoyed this presentation from the National Geographic Video Library. Well, it's just a page out of the past. From the Chattanooga Choo Choo to the Orient Express, from coast to coast and continent to continent. Seems like everything that's wonderful about the world is going away. The trains are one of those things. The romantic age of the rail gives way to the fast track of the future. They're hobos and tourists. They ride club car and box car. High tech, low tech, and little tech. But they all agree on one thing. You're riding a train, you just can't get enough. Oh, it's marvelous. That's a thrill for me. Ride the rails with National Geographic. You'll love those trains. Life, birth, struggle, death. In the wild, where at any moment a predator can suddenly become prey, only one law prevails, the law of survival. For the past 30 years, National Geographic filmmakers have captured nature's beauty and brutality. From the ocean's depths to the top of the world, uncovering and exploring the fascinating story of life on Earth. Join us now as we celebrate our world and all that is in it in 30 years of National Geographic specials.